Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching. This is the word of the Lord. This summer we're going through the parables as our sermon series, Um, and so this morning's parable is the wise and foolish builder. Uh, When we hear the image of storm in that scripture, I think those of us who've been in Spokane the last couple weeks um, can call to memory a couple of storms. Um, We've had two major storms, uh, specifically North Spokane, more than the South Hill, in the last two weeks. One on July 23rd and another one last night, which meant I had to come in early and readjust this sermon part. (laughs) Um, Those of us on the South Hill have been pretty lucky, knock on wood. Uh, Both times the storms came through the 23rd and last night, I observed a few gray clouds in the sky and some big gusts of wind, and that was about it. Uh, The storms passed pretty quickly, and they didn't leave any damage. So it was surprising to see the damage the storm caused just a few miles north of us on the news coverage. And in fact, I read this morning that Whitworth Presbyterian is worshiping outside for both worship services because of a tree that fell down on their sanctuary. And here are some images um, of the storm on July 23rd, some of the damage that it did. That's a tree root that came up underneath the foundation of the carport. And that's the um, trailer park in a Riverside area. some pretty major damage uh, was done by these windstorms that seemed to really not affect those of us who were on the South Hill or live on the South Hill, really didn't affect us at all. There was some pretty major damage done just north of us. Um, After the storm on July 23rd, I read on Facebook how Camp Spaulding had lost power. Uh, And the next day, that was when Pastor Betsy was up there speaking for the week, and lots of kids from our church were up there. And everyone had to be sent home on Thursday because the power still wasn't back on. And then uh, they had to delay the next camp by a day because still waiting for power. And I just heard from Barb Kuskevier, whose daughter works up at Camp Spaulding, that they've delayed the next camp because of the storm last night. Um, so fortunately, the camp on July 23rd, you know, with all the kids, I think there were 150 campers up there. They knew that the storm was coming, so they gathered all the campers and everyone, and they, and they brought them into the lakeside room where they were safe. Now, if you've been to Camp Spaulding, you know that the lakeside room is literally built on a really big rock. Um, It was solidly anchored to the ground, and that's a really safe place to be because it wasn't going anywhere. And when a storm approaches, we want to find somewhere safe like that, somewhere that is anchored to something solid. In our parable this morning, Jesus uses the common experience of a storm to get his disciples to sit up and take notice of something. The way Jesus describes the storm is exactly the same for both groups. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, is what he says. Jesus is clear that storms will come. It's what we anchor to in a storm that will determine our outcome. By the time we're adults, most of us have figured out that being a Christian does not prevent storms in our lives. People we care about get sick or die. We lose jobs. We struggle in relationships. We witness unexplained tragedy around us and in the world. We don't understand it, and many of us go through a stage of asking questions about why God would allow such things. But what most of us have figured out, even if we don't understand it, is that storms come. I think sometimes what we fear even more than the storm itself is the damage that it will do, how that storm will affect the rest of our lives. 
I'm guessing we all know people whose lives fell apart when an illness, a death, or a loss blew through their lives. Their lives resembled some of those photos we just saw. When a storm hits our lives, we want to be solidly anchored to something that will help us to gain perspective and get through the storm. Maybe even get through it having learned something more about ourselves and God. What Jesus is telling us is that the key, that thing that will keep us anchored to something solid in a storm, is living by his teaching. Living by Jesus' teaching is not easy. In our first scripture lesson, for instance, we hear anger with another Christian compared to murder. Jesus doesn't shy away from difficult topics. He, taught, he covers lust, divorce, retaliation, money, anxiety, and how we treat enemies, just to name a few. When we take seriously the task of really following Jesus, we may be tempted to say, impossible, and give up. However, if we give up too soon, we miss out on the key to weathering storms, which we all know will come. Jesus offers us a new, countercultural way to approach life. This new approach gives us something to anchor to in the storms that we encounter. They even prepare us for the storms to come. Both of the builders in the parable built their houses before storm season. By the time the storms hit, they were either anchored to something solid or they weren't. Practicing Jesus' teaching is not something we only try when we're in the midst of a storm. We need to begin before a storm hits so we're better prepared. Each time we put one of Jesus' teachings into practice, we anchor ourselves more solidly to our foundation, Jesus Christ. The first scripture lesson referring to reconciliation with our brothers and sisters in Christ is an example of a teaching that Jesus gives us that is really difficult to act on, but it will help anchor us to a solid foundation. This is one area that God has challenged me in over the last several years. I am naturally inclined to avoid conflict. It is much easier for me to try to repress hurt and anger than it is for me to confront someone who's hurt me or made me angry. However, in this first scripture lesson, Jesus tells us that he wants us to reconcile with our brothers and sisters before we come to the altar, what we call worship. At the root of this teaching is the value of people and relationships. Jesus wants us to remember that our brothers and sisters in Christ are God's beloved creation worth reconciling with. After all, we will be spending eternity together. I have a group of girlfriends. There are six of us, one of whom is here this morning. We commit to meeting together to talk about life and to pray for one another. This group started over a decade ago with two of us, and it eventually grew to six of us. These women are my closest friends, and we have been there for one another through many big life events, both exciting times and terrifying storms. Marriage, having children, struggling with depression, aging parents, the loss of a parent. God has used these women to help me follow him more faithfully not only by praying for them, but by living out some of Jesus' difficult teaching with them. In this group, we are very different. And as you can imagine, over the years, we've had misunderstandings and hurt feelings. There are a couple of women in the group who are better, who are better at, than most at using their voice and initiating difficult conversations. Because we all value our group and the friendships that we've built over the years, we have learned not to shy away from difficult conversations. I've had to tell these friends when they've said or done something that hurt my feelings. I've also been confronted when I've hurt someone's feelings. We have lived Jesus' teaching about not remaining angry at a sister in Christ, but instead reconciling. Jesus' teaching about anger and his value of peacemaking and reconciliation is not easy to follow. It leads to difficult and really uncomfortable conversations. But the result is more intimate and anchored relationships relationships that weather life's storms. By practicing Jesus' teaching together, these women and I have become more anchored to Christ and each other. And I know that when we face storms in the future, we will be there for each other, reminding each other that Christ is our anchor so that our lives and faith will not fall apart. Each of Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount could be a separate sermon or Bible study. In fact, many of them were this last year on Wednesday morning with Pastor Betsy. At the heart of Jesus' teachings, we discover that Jesus values people and relationships above most anything else. 
each of these offer us something to anchor to in the storms that we encounter in life. When we live these out, as difficult as it may be, and as unnatural as it may feel in the moment, we build a life that is anchored to something solid, Christ, and we can weather life's storms. Now sometimes even Christians realize the hard way that there are areas of our lives that are built in the sand. And here is where the grace of God comes in. If we find that we're being tossed by a storm, as Christians we are not alone. When the storm clears and we're looking at the rubble on top of the sand that used to be our life, the family of faith that we're a part of, the people that we have been living out Jesus' teachings with, the body of Christ is here with us, ready to help us build our new house on a sturdier foundation. The Apostle Paul encourages us with these words from his letter to the Ephesians, and this is from the message. God can do anything you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. Amen.